Okay. Good. We are good. So. so, hi, my name is Abigail. I'm a data scientist, which always starts, sounds like, you know, hi, I'm Abigail. I'm an alcoholic, but it's really different. Um, I've been a data scientist for a long time. And sort of the impetus for this is both Benji and I spend a lot of time talking about code and kind of writing better code. And a like common experience is you have a new graduate, a new data scientist, and they're fairly focused on like, what's the thing that people do? So like, I'm doing analysis, I'm making a graph, I'm now as a model. And especially if they're coming from sort of a research or academic environment, it's a big shift to sort of your output isn't just the thing you're creating, it's not just the analysis, but it's actually your code. Like that's a big part of your deliverable. And your code isn't just the thing that makes the output, it's something that other people need to be able to read, they need to really understand, and they need to be able to build on. And if your code isn't those things, it's not very useful in like a workplace context where like you have coworkers and at some point you're going to leave and somebody else is going to need to do something with this. And so both of us have done like a fair amount of writing and speaking about this. Um, and then large language models came along, right? And they kind of are changing the game on a lot of this stuff because they make a lot of things that used to be more difficult and kind of more manual um, a lot easier. And so that's sort of what we're going to talk about in small groups. We can sort of read a lot of materials, we can do this more casually and sort of talk about what you're interested in, where you're coming from. But that's kind of the impetus. It's that there's this coding stuff that's like really important to do. Um, and that I think doesn't always get talked that well in academic context either in sort of CS departments or in you know, more, more research, you know, science, social science departments, but that once you're in a job is like super, like in some ways the most important thing, like if you're not doing it, then the other things aren't really doing that much for you. Um, and then also now with large language models, it makes a lot of this stuff a lot easier. And so the piece we're going to talk about today is sort of refactoring the better code, putting our in functions as opposed to like procedurally, and we'll talk more about that. But that, those are kind of the two things that we're coming up in today. Yeah, I mean, I think just to like reiterate, I started the... The first half of my career was in consulting and a lot of that was like project-based like i would write a code as a data scientist to figure something out and then my deliverable was like a powerpoint or an excel mm -hmm. sheet and that was it and then you know maybe a month later i would try to look at the code i wrote and understand any of it or look at someone else's from like a previous project who went, who was on the engagement like a year earlier and had no idea what they were doing mm -hmm. um and then that was a big shift for me when I moved to my last company, which was, a, it was a product company, but the only technical people were data scientists. And we kind of figured out the hard way, like the importance of um, what I, I guess just generally like, and we'll talk about managing tech debt. Um, and then now at like where Abigail and I work, where there's like a really strong emphasis on um, like engineering culture, in addition to being like, a good, you know, data scientist because most of the people at CTG are at Capital Technology Group where we work have more of like a traditional software engineering background, like learning those skills too, which as like Abigail alluded to, when you're working with a team are probably just like baseline. Like if you're, you're it doesn't really matter how great your model performs if you're not, if no one else can use it and it can only work right on your laptop, right? So... Yeah, no, exactly. Um, can you, so it's because it's so What's your? I guess like, this is like, who's using large language models? Like, raise your hand if this is a thing that's now part of your process. I guess. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. For coding, for writing, for both, both, both. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. like ChatGPT mostly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have anybody mm -hmm. tried like? Or the API of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um. Tried bar. Yeah. You, you like Bard. That's no, I tried Bard. Oh. Like when it's saying I like it. <laughs> okay. um, I have used Bard. Google forces me to use it when I Google something. It has yes. AI response. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and it's in your docs. It's in sort of sheets. It's yeah. everywhere now. Okay, yes. cool. Um, any of the like open source stuff working with at all? Um, yeah, I think these things a little bit. Yeah. Them, but yeah. It's Star Coder. Yeah, they've got yeah. super good metrics, right? For coding. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I was running a VS code and it was causing other issues, so I had to take it out. So <laughs> and um, I've been playing a lot with Cursor, which is the an IDE that has basically ChatGPT embedded in it, so you can like you never leave the IDE. You're just writing, you can just highlight a line and be like, "Tell me what should I do about this?" And I'll just 
it gives you the effort directly into it. It's pretty nice. Yeah. That's cool. I like that with um with uh VS Code with uh what was it the Git Copilot. Oh, I, I like that it was like it's essentially that, but it's but it's yeah, so it's, it's it's like that, but but a little more. And that the biggest use case again for me is like I don't have to go to Stack Overflow now. Like for the most part, yes, that's 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 the, the, biggest, the single biggest use case is like off. how yeah. do I move the title on this plot to the left? Uh, I forgot how to do that, and I just like <laughs> how do I do that? And then it's like. Yeah. It just inserts it for you. I'm like, okay, there it is. Thank you. Um, I feel like I want to learn how to use LLMs better. So I'm excited. <laughs> um, I feel kind of like when you, you know, the, the days where like someone who's maybe not as tech savvy puts in like a whole question paragraph into Google and you're like, that's not how Google works. I kind of feel like that's how I'm using chat GPT right now for my coding. And I kind of want to, yeah, learn how to use it better. I still use please in my prompt sometimes. I think that's funny. Like, I feel like it's better for like my soul to be Yeah, I feel better. <laughs> but people say, and I have done the like prompt, like prompt engineering analysis, but people have said that like maybe it does a better job and it's polite. Oh. I don't know if that's true. That might not be true. I but um <laughs> yeah, you could probably actually test that really easily, but that's interesting. You can benchmark that. It's straight off of like human generated data. There's probably some truth to that. Be nice to people generally yeah. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> instead of like, hey, give me this now. You know, it's kind of kind of rude. Yeah, no, that's fair. Like maybe there's some, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and then like coding backgrounds, like. Who codes in R? Okay. Okay. Like other other tools you guys use? Other JavaScript. JavaScript. Okay. I use the VS Code. Okay. But yeah. okay. Um and Corto is my oh. common publication sort of platform. It's Lenny. I more, use that a little bit. Yeah, more so than like Jupyter. I, I tend okay. to prefer the yeah. Corto Markdown documents, yeah. which is sort of its own thing. But yeah, no, totally. It's interesting. Mostly Markdown. Yeah. Yeah, I like, I'm trying to get into Corto. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not totally, but I like, I like Markdown scrapes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, Do you want to? Yeah, sure. So I, I, as I said, I was a, I was a consultant. I used to work for Deloitte, so I have slides. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I yeah we can do it if, if you if you want me to drive or now is why oh. what's that oh. you're missing the I know now we're just so have to have access oh, oh that's good oh because it's not signed in on my I'm signed in it I'll, I'll I'll just do, you know what I don't think I really need them I'll just use them for I do them for myself so that I know what mm -hmm. I do everything but I have them myself and I can send them to okay can make, and then we make, can post them I can make them open if people are interested in it. All right. They just this. I can put a download a version. I have the link. Can you stick with PDF? Yeah. Let me just make. You know what? Let me see if this is. Um, let me just make this available to everybody. Yeah, that's why it's not okay. Anyone with the link. Okay. Now you should be good. There they are. We're we're doing a workshop in a couple months. That's a that's a much expanded version of this. And the things we're going to talk about are refactoring functions, refactoring slash functions, um, documentation. Possibly unit testing and definitely version control. Um, version control is the best. It's the other like you gotta do it and nothing else works. You might find um, putting things on GitHub is like the best. It's, it's a great habit. Great uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what is the organization that you're a part of now? Um, we're both at Capital Technology Group, which is a software development company that yeah. mostly does federal work. So I'm on a contract for DHS. Are you at CDC? CDC, yeah. Uh, it's like um, on the civilian side of government, so not like defense contracting. Well, but maybe I'll in the future. Back there. Yeah, at some, <laughs> at some point we'll both, at some point we'll be back there, both of us. Um, so... I've given versions of this talk before, and I usually start with this this story about how I two years ago or three years ago, it's all kind of a blur. But I was it was in the middle of COVID, and I'm sitting at my dining room table, and it's I just got off a scheduled 11 p.m. Zoom call that lasted like an hour, and I'm like, how like the hell did I find myself in this situation where we're scheduling 11 p.m. Zoom calls, and um. The reason why, in retrospect, was that 
we had in a attempt to make to to make our customer happy um we kept pushing new features to our product but then at, at a certain point pretty quickly um those features weren't really written well and they weren't really incorporated into the whole system and it got to a point where doing like really like minor things like just like changing um like text would take really long like really long life cycles and that's why we had to start having these 11 p.m meetings eventually we got out of it and thankfully for me but probably not for the company that they did not they did not renew this work with us like they were happy with it but they didn't there wasn't like a a phase two of it because that would have required me actually fixing everything um but that's like got me thinking and that was like the first time that that this idea of tech debt really um really became apparent to me and and why it's important um and so Tech, tech debt, you know, what, what is tech debt, I guess, first off. So uh, Ward Cunningham, it, it, he was the person who came up with this term of technical debt. Um, and this is his, his definition. So shipping first time code is like going into debt. A little bit of debt speeds development. So as long as it's paid back promptly with a rewrite, the danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. Every minute spent on not quite right code counts as interest on that debt. So the idea here is just like in a business sometimes or, you know, uh, in your, your personal life, it makes sense to go into debt to, to do something important, like, you know, take out a mortgage to buy a house or you only get paid twice a month, but you need to buy, you know, your groceries today. And so certain types of debt make sense, but if you don't pay that debt back, it becomes problematic. Like for your house, you'll get kicked out, your credit card bills will ramp up. Um, but in the case of a software system, which, you know, your data science products are, um, eventually it just gets too hard to make changes or adapt and, um, and, and, and really like do anything with it. Um, so there's, there's different types of, of tech debt as, as I think of it, there's intentional tech debt, unintentional tech debt, short-term tech debt, and long-term tech debt. So like, if you just write like bad code because you did it no better, like, or because you're you're using you're maybe you're not familiar with a framework or something like that that would be like unintentional tech debt but it could it could be short term like you're going to fix it you're going to figure it out um but sometimes it's intentional like you're like I'm going to get this feature across the line um but I'm I'm scheduling time next week to fix it so you're taking like you know short term gain for a little bit of pain in the future but um you're planning to fix it um, and sometimes you do take intentional long-term tech debt. Like there's a, a famous case of this is that um, Dropbox originally didn't have its own uh, infrastructure. It was just basically like a front end to AWS. And they, if, I mean, maybe this, maybe he's saying this in hindsight, but uh, I'm forgetting if it was their CTO or one of their chief engineers said that they they knew if they succeeded, they would have to build their own uh, server, you know, data centers. Um, so like, well, then why didn't you just do it in the first place? Um, because they, they didn't have the money to do it in the first place. It didn't like, they couldn't do it in the first place, but that was debt that they were carrying. Like they knew long-term that they'd never be able to, um, just rely on AWS indefinitely. Um, but today I think we're going to focus on unintentional short-term debt, um, which is like, you don't necessarily need to say like bad code, but just like suboptimal code. Um, and um, I think, so we're going to talk about refactoring and this idea of LeBlanc's law is that later is never. So like, if you say you're going to do something, you know, later, you're never really going to do it. Um, and if you incorporate uh, refactoring into your, um, into how you work as part of like your schedule and you, or you make it and a part of, your your coding process, you'll um, you'll be able to to pay back that unintentional short term tech debt as you go instead of having that suboptimal code kind of like weigh on you and your teams in the future and oftentimes long after you're gone. So um, 
refact so what's refactoring and so the idea behind refactoring is changing restructuring existing code without changing its external behavior so that means that the um you know like a, a data science example your model might not have any different outputs um or it might not perform any better but um it's easier you have you have better documentation or it's easier to to read or it's more transportable um okay just like a quick um so what what's the like the point of this um so refactoring helps you pay down tech debt as you go it's proactive instead of reactive so like the situation that i was in you know in my 11 p.m zoom meetings if we had incorporated refactoring into our workflow um and made it something important that we we had done we wouldn't have had the need to do like you know, guys, we need to spend the next week fixing everything. Like it, we could have been doing it as we went along. Um, and if you um, if you if you incorporate this, it's it is also like a strategic investment in your future, both as like an individual and as a team, um, because it helps you upskill and just get better at writing sustainable sustainable code. Um, so the, you know, just the takeaways is that tech debt is the backlog created when developing unsustainable, non-reusable code. Um, and in my opinion, the worst kind of code, the worst kind of tech debt is short-term unintentional tech debt. So like just bad code is the worst kind. Um, and while the suboptimal code is inevitable, um, you can make a plan to pay it back with refactoring. Cool. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let me pull up. The, uh, yeah, the, I'll let you. Did we? Oh. I asked, like, there a we bit go. of a tangent question. This is more like a workplace culture. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so if you, if you find yourself on a team where you are, like, very committed to uh, paying down your personal tech debt, yeah. um, but you find that other members of that team are not, as diligent about that, how do you kind of navigate that? Is that something that like is it worth your time to like kind of pay down the other person's tech debt? Is that something that you would like want to talk to a manager about or like bring up as an issue? I don't know. It, it, it's kind of yeah. Yeah, I mean, my first my first impression is that like it's mm -hmm. a, a really important indicator of your team's like technical culture that like if they don't care about um about like writing good code and they only care about like pushing like pushing features basically mm -hmm. like it's not a good indicator of where of your team's culture um and like i if you um i i wrote about like comparing companies like that had like horrible collapses over <laughs> overnight or if not overnight like not uh, over the span of weeks or months. A lot of it sometimes does come down to tech debt. Um, whereas like other companies that you don't, that don't make the news for um, doing things incorrectly. And when you expect to have cultures where they like every Friday is like a, a day, you don't write new, you don't, you don't work on new features. You just fix up and clean up old, old code. So I'm not really sure what you would do about it if you had a team that was like, no, nah, no, I don't care. Leave. Leave. <laughs> it's always the answer. Yeah. You're never going to fix it. Leave. Yeah, you're probably not going to fix a, a play, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe you can be a, you should do your part. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying don't try, yeah. but I mean, especially if you're pretty junior. Right. You know? I mean, yeah, I, it, it, it's, I guess, like a common kind of it's a good question for a yeah. project. It's a good question for like a, yeah. for like an interview. Yeah. If you're like interviewing at a That's company. I think it's like a really good question to ask, like how they mm -hmm. just say, like, how do you, what's your philosophy of managing tech debt? Mm -hmm. Also, what do you use for version control? Mm -hmm. I like, yeah. Well, everyone's going to say these. No, no, I know, have had, like, I have had, oh yeah, we've been thinking about Git. That's bad. Actually true. I did. I did an interview somewhere where they said they they don't use it. Yeah, a lot of like a DOD A lot play. of people don't. Yeah, no, really. Like a lot of folks doing. Like, if you're an engineer, if you're an engineering job, you're probably using Git. But yeah, especially around DoD and the government, and just a lot of data science or research jobs 
where there is code, do not use version control tools. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a huge differentiator. And typically, like, if they're not, there's other stuff that's wrong. And if they are, there's probably other stuff that's good. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll ask about it. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> good. So we, I don't want to spend too long on this because I want to get some, some code, but like you guys know what large language models are, like you've used them broadly. They are, you know, they process and generate, you know, human text and answer questions and summarize data and translate languages. Um, you've used GPT, Claude from Anthropic is another big one that has similar capabilities, Bard we were discussing and is less great. Um, and then there are all the open source ones. So Facebook's model, Llama, got leaked at some point. And then there's all these descendants of it that are um, that are training in various ways to do niche tasks or to be better. Um, there's some sort of code specific large language models as well um, that have been kind of fine tuned on on coding tasks, um, including there's some there's some llama. Well, there's like code llama now is a new one. Um, there are all these what are called sort of benchmarks. So there are these data sets that are basically question more or less question answer pairs for both text but also for coding. And so you can see like if you're working in Python or in another language or you have data science tasks or general coding tasks, like you can, there are, there are really good metrics for like which of these are performing well on those. Um, GP24, I think is the model you can actually like use easily as a consumer that is doing the best, but there are now some, some llama descendants that do quite well on coding as well. It's just, you have to set up some of your own infrastructure to run them or work with somebody and basically pay somebody to, to do that for you. Um, so the easiest ones to, you know, to get started with are, are the GBT models and, and Claude two. Um, this is a more technical definition. I can read it. You can read it. I asked GBT four. Um, <laughs> and I did, I don't generally like, that's usually not super useful to me in my writing. Like I'll ask it and then I'll like iterate and iterate, but like, yeah, I don't, like, I, I work with this stuff, like, I have a very broad understanding of what it does, but like, if you ask me to define a transformer, I would be stuck, so I'm not going to try. Um, I have a really good article, if anyone wants it, um, that describes, like, how it uses transformers through many layers, but it explains it non-technically, um, so just let me know if you're interested. Um. So you can think of like LLMs are basically doing text synthesis, right? They, you know, take various kinds of text that can summarize things really well. They can train on a response of text and coding is text. Like it's not, it's not human text exactly, but it's, it's text. And um, there's an enormous amount of code that is in the training data for any of the LLMs you're going to use. Um, and you can kind of see there's like more code of different kinds than others and that affects the performance. So like there's a ton of Python code, like it writes really good Python. There's much less R. It will write R, but I, and there aren't any benchmarks on this, but my sense is like, it's not quite as good. Um, something like Stata or SAS or SPSS, it's much more niche and where there's really not much on GitHub. It's, it's not going to do as well, but it, it'll do. So look, it just, coding is just a specialized form of text and it knows a lot about it. So it does these tasks, you know, varying degrees of well, but like well enough to be useful for many coders. Um, and also it passes all of our coding tests, which is a problem for hiring, um, but not a problem for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is actually like I used to do these like um like daily challenges and I would do it and then I'd be like, okay, how do you improve it? And it's like it's it, it kind of like if if you have like soft engineering challenges, like where it's like design an algorithm, it kind of like, well, you can just ask Chat to do it, it will it, it will get like the most efficient answer every time. You know, like, so, yeah, it's so, a problem. Like, so, um, I mean, I don't know. Is it a problem? Well, it depends. I think it's a problem if you're if you're hiring. Yeah, but I think it's a problem. Shouldn't be asking people. To look, I, I agree. Like, I agree. And look, my my pet peeve right now for hiring for people who are doing hiring is, um, is that if you have a hiring screen which is answerable by GP, by ChatGPT and you are not monitoring somebody, then you are screening for people who cheat, and that's like a bad thing to screen for. So I, I don't know. I think if you're doing hiring, you need to like figure that out. Yeah, or, and... just let use <laughs> or let them use yeah. it. But then if you, if you don't use it, you need better questions. Yeah, they need better questions. Um, yeah. But yeah. Oh, I meant to do a chat. Okay. So there's, you can imagine a graph of Stack Overflow traffic. It's about <laughs> like what you would expect. Like 
we all used to code via Stack Overflow and now we code via GPT. So um, yeah, and I always say code by like what we'll talk about, but like it's, it doesn't like the code it writes is generally not, not great. Um, it structures things in a way, which is like rarely the way I would exactly structure things. But going from like a, a way a lot of people are sort of new to this code, um, it, it's like an improvement. Like it will generally like give you like mediocre code. Um, and if you and there are questions you can ask that we'll talk about that we'll get it that we'll get it to, to be better. Um, okay, so um, you will be using these in your jobs coding. Um, like some of that we don't really know how yet. Like you know people everybody's getting it in their IDEs, and now there'll be more of that. There's some copyright issues um, where like, especially if you're writing software, like somebody's gonna figure that out and like there will be lawsuits and whatever, whatever. Um, on the data science side, analysis side, we'll probably less worry about lawsuits because we're not generally creating software that's like getting shipped and then someone can be like, oh, we opened up your software and you stole this from us. So, um, but in some capacity, like you'll you'll be using this stuff. Um, you'll be using it to help write documentation for you. So like a readme file on your GitHub repo that explains what this does, and then your sort of function level documentation. So like, we'll talk about this in a minute, like functions, typically you want them to say what they are doing and what they take for inputs and what they return as outputs. Um, writing code, as we'll talk about, um, testing your code. Um, and then it also can give you sort of personal advice troubleshooting. So like if you're getting started using Git, you know, you're like, I wanna do this, I wanna branch this, I wanna whatever, like it will, tell you how to do that and when you post your error messages it will you know generally give you fairly good advice on how to do that so it makes a lot of coding stuff a lot easier it's really great though my next shock fans yeah right which is like i don't want to memorize that yeah, no, right. like, is that, okay. yeah. um yeah even barn does pretty well with those that's cool yeah okay not the right one okay um okay so, okay, so um, when you talk about functions, um, okay, like who could give me a definition of a function if I asked? Mm, it's a black box, it's like input, and then it's output. Well, we hope it's not a black box, like we, we can read it, but yeah, exactly. So we think about function, um, like both, both, you know, in math and in coding as something that takes input and always returns the same output. And ideally when we talk about coding, it doesn't do other things. Like it does something within the function, but the only ways it's really affecting you are it takes that input and it returns that output and always returns the same output. And like, it's not always like that. Sometimes it does some things while I'm doing other things. Um, sometimes there's, there are environmental issues which affect, you know, you might put the same input in and get an output. But like, basically that's what we're talking about when we're talking about function. We're talking about ideally a small unit of code that does one thing on some inputs to return an output. Um, and we think of this in contrast, sort of coding functionally with functions as opposed to like coding sort of procedurally. So if you're using a language like SPSS or SAS or Stata, then like typically like your code frequently like looks kind of like a block. Like it starts here, it ends here, it does a bunch of things in order. You know, maybe you have some various levels of indentation, um, but like that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and it's not neat. Um, and when we talk about coding with functions, your code looks looks different. So you have these little pieces of functions. You kind of just glance at it and see how it looks different. Um, they're not, they're hopefully not huge. They hopefully don't have huge levels of indentation. They're kind of small and neat and they do a thing. You can look at it and see what it does. And if you are, um, if you're calling a function more than once, you're just writing it once and then you're calling it and your functions that do more things, do more things because they are calling the smaller functions. And while this is like not always possible, like for a lot of the kinds of things you're doing, these can all wrap up into kind of a main function, which takes some parameters. And like the parameters are things that are like gonna, they're the things that are gonna change, like your variables are gonna change. So like maybe I'm running it today um, and I'm putting in a certain date range and that's what's changing. But like ideally, if this is some code that's like running frequently, I'm not actually changing the code each time. Like the things that are gonna change are the things that I can change via my main function, via the, the, the arguments that it's taking and everything else stays the same. So like, I don't have to go into it. Um, so like that's sort of kind of a, you can think of that as like the kind of sort of a goal for like, what should my, what should my, um, like what is a function? What should my code look like? Um, I like to think of this analogy. It's like when you like build a house, like if you want a house built, you hire someone to build your house. And then that person hires a plumber and electrician and, you know, a carpenter and stuff like that. And so like when you're writing this, 
you, you hire a general contractor and a lot of times you will have like, like, like a main function or like a general contractor function that's like build the house. You know, <laughs> like, so like as, a, as like the end user, and even if you are the end user of your own code, then you can just call the build your house function. Um, and then if you also, and then if you need to add add something else, you can just add that to your to your general contractor function. Like, oh, I need a new air conditioning system also. Yeah. My general contractor is going to take care of it too. Yeah. And I should be able to add that right. without like touching any other things. Like all the other stuff is built, right? I'm just we're adding a thing that does a thing without, like the goal is like once stuff is written, like I want to have to touch that as little as possible um because it's done and it works and i want to like if i add a thing it shouldn't break everything else in my code yeah okay so why why do we do this um it's easier to understand um because it's in smaller manageable pieces like i can look at this and and say oh this is what this does um as opposed to like i'm trying to find out where the where like what's the piece that does this thing and like i, I don't know where in my code it is um, you're more, it's, it makes it easier to, to avoid side effects. So that's like a function changes something you didn't mean for it to change. So it's doing something besides taking an input and returning an output. Uh, it makes it hard to like understand what your code is doing. It introduces all kinds of broken things. Um, so like ideally all we're doing is each, with each piece of our code, we're taking an input or set of inputs and we're returning this output that we're then doing something else with in the next function. Um, it was more modular. So um, I can rearrange it, I can reuse it, I can call it more than once, and then I can reuse it in other things. So like, I, for instance, like if I have a function that like makes me a really good graph, so like there's a formative graph I always want, right? I have like a bar graph that is the font I want, and it puts the it puts the, the legend in the place that I want, and it's the color scheme that I want, and it takes, you know, whatever, it takes a data frame or a table, and it, you know, that's in a sort of general format, and like every time I want that kind of graph, or my organization wants that kind of graph, I use the same function, which ideally like lives in a place where I'm not copying and pasting it. I can just import it somehow, right? Um, and it's just much easier to do that as opposed to like if I had some code with, where I was like hard coding, you know, the title name each time or whatever, then that's like much harder to use. Whereas if I have this thing that's like abstracted and does this one thing, then like I, I can keep using it. Um, okay, so... Like in an R, we have a function name, we have some inputs, it does a thing, it returns a thing. Um, and we start talking about this. So like small, focused on a single task, you use descriptive names for like what things actually do when there's various, um, there's like style and formatting stuff that you, you can use that are that are um, kind of rules for, for how things should be formatted. Um, Where would one find those kind of general, or is that organization? Um, so PEP8, that's the, that's the- For Python, there's like a, a, like a very like strict one that like you're supposed to like everyone follows called Pep8. Um, for for R, there's like different styles, but there's not like a community agreed upon like Bible that everyone like thou shalt like, follow this style. Um, and then there, I think there's just like general like best, yeah best practices that are like in a bunch of different books. That, but I think the most important thing is like to have one and stick to it. Yeah, it really depends. Like, so like some some organizations are will be like Pep8, and there's their tools you can run to see if your code is compliant with that. Um, called linters, and um, it would be like a for for like data science or analysis, it would be definitely like at the high end of engineering for that to be happening for like that to be happening in your organization. Um, beyond that, it is kind of like somebody might be like here are organizational standards or it might be sort of like you're trying to figure out what what level do we need to, does this need to be in order for our code to work so like somebody might might tell you like you know your code is in functions you write comments you know don't do like crazy levels of indentation so it might be more or less formal but yeah pep is is the python standard um and you'll you'll find a lot more engineers adhering to it than you will on the data science analysis side. Um, but I think it's, I think it's definitely useful to to look at. Um, okay, so yeah, like a lot of my code, I try to be sort of structured like this. And sometimes it's it's not doable, but you know, smaller functions that each do one thing that that roll up to a main function, and um, where. 
I am sort of changing, like I might change the parameters here, like here I might change what this is, this, like what my input text, if it's reading a text file or outputting a text, then, then I can change the name of that, but I'm not, I'm not messing with the rest of it. Um, okay. Okay. So like, how can LLMs help? Like, if you ask uh, like ChatGPT to like write you some code, like it will write you some code, it will not be structured well. Like generally it will not use functions. It will kind of be, here's, it will be fairly procedural. Um, but if you ask it specifically, like I want my code to be in functions, you know, rewrite this. So there's, there's a main function that calls things, write me documentation. Like you just have to get really specific, but like it, it will do it and it will do it reasonably well. Um, again, if you ask specifically, and I, I suppose politely, right. um, my experience has been that it doesn't do like, if there's a larger, how do I structure this piece of code to be kind of logical? Um, I know that's like really vague, like logical is really vague, but like in a way that like, it, I, I don't think it does a terrific job with that. Um, but just taking it from like procedural code to code that is in functions and documented, and like pretty good. Like it, it will do that for you if you're if you're specific. Um, I think paragraphs are fine, like however you want it to, but like, you know, paste, like you can definitely paste the code and be like, can you help me restructure this, you know, to be in functions or better written, um, that kind of thing. And I don't know that there's like a really, there's always like some people are really into prompting. And I don't know that it's super important that there's like a specific way you prompt it, but the kind of the things you would ask a person, like it, it will it will do okay at that. Um, so we brought some code to look at and you have a computer out and you have, do you have a, um, so I don't know. We can just we have five or six online, I think, too. Okay. To get their yeah. I guess what everything is gonna be useful to you. Um, like we can take questions, we can look at this and try to make it you can see like this is very basic, but it's like doing some things. We're like repeating ourselves a lot here. We have some like if then statements that make it like hard, kind of under hard, hard to understand what's going on. Um, we have no functions. We have like it returns a graph and it's a little unclear. So if, you, if it's going to be useful to you to go through this and kind of rewrite it and get comments, that's fine. If there's something else that's going to be useful to you, if you just have questions, um, yeah, kind of however, however you want to do the next ten minutes. I like the idea of working through. Okay. Yeah. Let's work through the code. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. No, great. Um, yeah, pull it up on. on so if you want the calendar invite. It's the link to it. Um, and I for those online, I posted the link in the chat. I hope they see. Yeah. So Iris is a really common data set. You want us to make it better? Do you think it's yeah, better? make it better. Like sort of so here's some nice things to think about. Think about like um you don't want to if you've like a, a, a line that's repeating itself a lot then you want to find a better way of doing that um if the if then statements are kind of a mess here you want something that um that that's more transparent if you have if you're hard coding numbers that's probably something you want to avoid and yeah i mean think about documentation think about functions if you have questions you know i can certainly answer but yeah you know take a look at this see you know play around with it I think that's a strong point of of the chat to be What's that? I mean, I mean this like this piece of code, I don't know if we intentionally made it this way. I think this is like where chat to be really good at. Oh, making bad code? I mean, no, making like oh for, yeah, like making it. Like yeah. I mean making for humans, like for us, it looks very tidy, but yeah. we know that there are a lot of duplication yeah. and that and it can yeah. definitely be made better. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> but it works. It does work. It makes the graph at the end. And so if the goal is the graph at the end, it made it, but like, eh. I used it for our, like I had a job interview that was like a, like it was like a week long. It's like a take home. Oh man. Yeah. Like a take home thing. And it was actually like a, it was more about, it was like, I can show you the, the GitLab repo for it, but it was like, um it was 
like designing like an alarm system for like a satellite yeah. when it went above a certain temperature or something and like and um it was like i wanted to do it in i wanted to use like an object oriented framework yeah. for it which i'm not like yeah yeah so like no, that so... was really helpful yeah for, like design a class that does yeah, this totally and it what was interesting about it for like the, i think it was a 3.5 i don't know if it was a four but yeah. and it was like what was interesting about it was that it um oh uh emmanuel has a question oh okay. oh do, do i need to un hi oh there you go thanks for the talk appreciate you coming to the um G gw coders meeting and, and giving a talk um I just had a like a really practical question. How do you do this? How does it fit into your workflow using LLMs? Do you are you cutting and pasting code into ChatGPT or do you have it integrated into your IDE somehow? So I was using um okay, so first of all, for my actual like job, I, I'm not allowed to use it, so I don't use it. But for my like separate coding stuff, um I yeah, basically I'm copying and pasting. So I was using VS Code with um with copilot integrated with it and so that is actually like in your workflow and in a much more like it's in your ide but i don't really like vs code um and it just wasn't wasn't worth it to me so i'll probably try that again or it'll or i assume it will be integrated into any other you know any ide that i'm using probably a couple years from now anyway um because yeah i am copying and pasting and i don't i don't super like it it will um it will output a .py file um i think maybe just for code interpreter um and so you can do it that way if you want especially because like sometimes i've like lost indentation and stuff from just copying and pasting um but yeah i'm copying and pasting and i don't i don't like it as a workflow but i assume somebody will fix that for me fairly soon it doesn't mind when you lose the indentation, like you ask it a question and then you just paste a bunch of code after it, it, it can figure out. Uh, no. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. So from, from putting things into GPT, it, it doesn't lose any of that. Like it, it's not a problem. It's the pulling it back in afterwards. And also it, the other problem with the workflow is that it, um, when we're iterating with code and we fix something and we move on, sometimes it will revert back to the previous code and it will break it again. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not like, it's frustrating. You kind of have to, so it's easier if you do like one piece at a time, like fix a thing, iterate, here's the next piece as opposed to here's all of my code again. Cause that is every time it's, here's all my code again and you're pasting it in, it is an opportunity for it to break it. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's not great. I don't love it as a workflow, um, but yeah, I assume like all this stuff will will get integrated into, into all the IDEs at some point. So. It will. It's one of those questions. Like I'm not trying to fix it because some somebody else will sell me the fix. In VS Code, I used it with Copilot, and it does. It's like um, spell check almost, I and mean, it just it makes suggestions more like when you're texting. What is the next word? So you start a function, and it gives you like five choices of functions that you might be wanting, and then if you hit tab, it will go on that. If you try, they they also have an extension for Star Coder, which is an open source model, I guess. Um, and it's more of a, you ask it, like, write me a function that does this, and it writes the function. So it's more like a chat GPT type system, whereas Copilot is more like a auto writer for you. Um, but don't try to run both is my experience, because it will just cause all kinds of havoc in your system. And I know our studio is going to have Copilot integrated very soon, so. Oh, yeah. that's cool, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, there's gonna be uh, the PASA conference next month. Um, one of the PASA folks is giving a talk on this that will be on YouTube afterwards, so. And then we'll be. I'll be there. Are you going? Are you going to that? I am not. Um, I'm not. But I. I yeah. I, I will definitely watch. I think you're going to be at the our Gov conference, right? In. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll see you there. Yeah. We're. Yeah. We're doing. We're doing, we're doing a workshop. workshop, like a full day version of kind of this talk. Yeah. And yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to be giving a talk. Um. Yes. I. I don't know what sure. yet. 
Jared. <laughs> yeah, no, he will. Jared, no, J- sure Jared's not. still pinging my the folks I recommended, so he's definitely still putting together the the calendar. Nice. I got some interesting responses based off yeah. how I. Well, I finished. Oh yeah. Huh. Yeah. So like the first time I just said, like, how could I improve improve this? Just like how would how would I improve this code? I just I would basically show it. And it did like it definitely, I mean, I can't, is there a way for me to share my screen here? Or is like not really? Right? Um well if you want to go to the Zoom is yourself, it's do you have a tab open? Uh yeah, I just need the zoom. So. Go dot gwu dot edu. Uh-huh. Um, GW coders zoom dot GW slash slash GW coders zoom, and that then I can yeah, stop. So I, I, Try yeah. RW zoom, it should take you to the same place. RW zoom, yeah, after the dot edu slash, just oh, yeah, type it in instead of me. <laughs> The the website for this club is fantastic. It's the the GitHub IO. I like. I need to fix my GitHub profile to be okay. More there like you go. So I'm gonna stop sharing, and then you can share, Benji. Everyone should have access for sharing. Myself. There we go. Okay. Oh. Let's see. Am I sharing the right thing? Yep. Yep. Oh, I see so. code. So, and for this first one, I just said, um, how would I improve this code? And just copy and paste everything in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it definitely did some improvements. So like this is this is nice. It doesn't import it. It doesn't uh, install it unless it's actually installed. Uh, which you know, and then here this instead of the if else like loop, it made a dictionary and then uses the map function to map it. And I think that's definitely an improvement. Like it's easier to follow what's going on here than the than the if else loop. Um, but then like this part isn't, I don't love this next part. Like there's still a lot of, a lot of repeating and it's definitely more in that like procedural yeah. method that Abigail was talking about, but it's, it's still like an improvement for sure. Um, but then this next one, I said, I was like more specific. I said, how can I improve this code using solid principles and solids more of like, it's kind of, it's pretty old school, I guess, but like it's um a group of of various principles around clean code. Like and you can look look it up, but like it's a few things, but it's it's a lot of the stuff that like Abigail was talking about. Like if you do all a lot of it's related to object-oriented programming, but like one like single responsibility principle, like ha- like having a function only do one thing and a bunch of other stuff but this this got like a lot better i thought um where it's like actually defining functions for everything and then it it does do like it has a like this main function like the plot bar function and then um i thought and then you know this if things not great but um this was like instead of just saying like improve just make my code better if you're like make my code you know it's like i like to think about this as like if i had an intern Yes. It's like, you know, like who is who is very, very like eager to do the right thing, but like needed a lot of direction. Um, and then after this, I said, you know, it said so like a lot of this is um related to object-oriented programming. So I said, you know, so how can I turn this into an object-oriented framework? Um, and it made a class for it um instead. Um yeah. and no 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 function comments, but if you ask for Function level comments, it, it will it will write them for you. 
So yeah, the specificity. Right. Yeah, I think the specificity yeah. helps, helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, the function level comments is really helpful. Yeah. Because uh -huh, going yeah. back and writing those is always yeah. you mean to, you mean you well, well, but yeah. then you know. <laughs> then you have to try to remember what you were doing in the first Why place. you did it, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I find that I'm using this a lot like at work when I'm like you're not allowed to use it. Right? Right, let's use it. You're it's not, blocked. Oh, it's blocked from your it's so it's interesting. The GSA, I got permission to use it. Like if you basically you just ask and you get permission. And the CDC hasn't blocked it. Yeah, I asked. Um they said no. Interesting. No. I just I use it for like the biggest thing I use it for is like blank screen. Proud like yep. like mm -hmm. you know, it's like writer's box, like you're starting and you don't want to start. It's like some like this is what I want to do. I got something back. It's pretty mediocre, but it's probably as good as what I would have read it in the first hour anyway. Yeah, yeah. Totally. You know, so or like first yeah. couple hours. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah. so, like, I'm finding that it's like if something what would have taken me like eight hours to do, and now it takes me like six. Yeah, you know, which yeah. Is awesome. No, it's that's better. Great. It's like, that's, yeah. that's great. You know, to to save that time. Yeah. No. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, I think we're almost done. But any questions, comments? Yeah, well, I just want to say I, I also did on, on my side and anyway. yeah. yeah, what did you oh was yeah. it? Uh can I can I also present? Yeah, I stopped showing, yeah. so you should be good. Oh well, I'm not resuming oh. what is it? Oh uh, go.gwu.edu. So go.gwu.edu. Yeah. Then you can just use R slash RW Zoom. It all goes to the same place. Is there a movie? We're also. Uh... <laughs> ah, there we well. go. Yeah, what I found it's not really helpful for is troubleshooting, like when you have a bunch of things, like if you have a web server or something. So, yeah, I'm using it myself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good at figuring out like why React isn't showing up. Right. right? <laughs> My web page is not showing up is not a question and can no. answer. <laughs> it's like somewhere buried in there is a problem, but there's way too much for it to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. will. Maybe you'll have code like like co highlight for like Linux, like while you're getting your like you're running the bash bash <laughs> terminal and you get an error and it tells you what's like what it thinks you should do. But it's interesting with Bard now that it's integrated into Google. Google. Uh, so like I because I, I see it, like I'll say yeah, yeah. like I'm getting this error. Why? Right. And it shows up first, so I look at that first. Right. And I'm finding more and more times that is enough. I don't have to go down through all the links. Oh, interesting. So it's doing a good enough job at like helping you understand why you're getting an error. Now you still have to go and fix the error because yeah. it doesn't know where on my server where that file is per se. But it does a decent job of that. And, and it's also there. It like so. makes stuff up from time to time. It does a little bit. I had this lawyer told me to use like I was like, how do I do this? They told me to use a R package that doesn't exist. Yes, I still do that all the time. But yes, but I think that's because. But it was so. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. For sure. Bye. 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 So what did you? What did you get? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, because I have I've been using uh, ChatGPT throughout the, like the four months uh, in my uh, in my previous project. And uh, right now, yeah, I just, uh, uh, since I have Sibon installed, so yeah. I deleted the yeah. first line, and then I just copy and pasted everything as we did. Yeah. And then I wrote like, like four little sure. line here. But I heard that somehow it, it, it improves uh, like your conversation with ChatGPT so that it knows that what below this, uh, yeah. I mean, above this line, uh, is the information you provide you want them to do, and below this line will be your instructions. Yeah, I said make this piece of code better by doing these 
and I said one through three, one is to not hurt any functionality of it, then it will make sure that ChatGPT does not change anything. Yeah. Two is decrease the amount of the code. That's my second second okay. primary objective. Yeah. And three is create functions, code Good. functions, and yeah. then implement them in the main function. Good, yeah, so did too. Yeah, and lastly, I said, show me the improved code. For example, sometimes I would say that show me the only the improved part, but not the whole code, yeah. the full code. Then it will only show me yeah. Mm -hmm. uh the changes and where it made changes and then good i got yeah this. yeah and yeah. i think it's, it, it's done kind of a good job like yeah. it follows what like the primary objective is that i run both of both versions and they go both give me the same result yep. which means different functionality is not changed yep. right. and then it follows what i said well define the functions then i got function function good. function and then finally the main function and after the definition of the main function, it calls the main function. Yep, good. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's much better. <laughs> yeah. 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 And like there's a few things I might speak. So like the you're we're hard coding some thresholds in right now. There's like the for loop, which I don't love. But yeah, no, this is like much, yeah, this is much better. Yeah. And I think it can still be like updated when you keep like if we keep going your conversation with ChatGPT, yeah. you can make it much much better. Yeah. Totally, but no, I mean, this is like a great, this is like a great start. Uh, yeah, that's also, oh, that's on, only my personal experience. Yeah, in, yeah. In this no, definitely. Yeah, thank you. What will also be interesting is when, so at least my understanding is GPT will remember like 8,000 tokens back, but Claude 2 remembers like 100,000 tokens back. So it'll be interesting to see like how much better it gets for you. Yeah the more it has in a single conversation, like how you use functions, like, yeah, yeah kind of like your own. Yeah. Assistant code writer. <laughs> sure. It's... Your style. Yeah. Cool. Okay. okay. A lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot. I think putting, I, I read on the, 